Nations Radio. My name is Henrik Palmgren coming to you from the west coast of Sweden. Thank you for tuning in to our internet radio broadcast. We are here twice a week on Thursdays and Sundays. And the website you should keep an eye on is redicecreations.com. Today we have an interesting program ahead of us. We are going to follow up on our World War II theme and talk about the rise of Hitler and we're going to talk about who potentially put him there into power. Uh, our guest is Greg Hallett and he's the author to the book Hitler was a British agent. This uh, is an interesting area that I'm looking forward to exploring further with Greg. Uh, the website you should take a look at is greghallett.com for more material on what we'll be talking about here today. So let's say welcome to our guest. Uh, hi Greg, finally. Thank you for coming on Red Ice Creations Radio. G'day, how are you? Um, um, greetings from New Zealand. Yeah, exactly. Greetings from New Zealand. Uh, we are fine up here in Sweden and uh, we <coughs> it's it's excellent to have you on the line. Finally, finally we managed to pull this together here, so to speak. Uh, and I'm looking Thank forward you. to you know talking about your book here today, Hitler Was a British Agent. Uh, basically, I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, w when you began your research on, on this book and uh, I guess also what got you interested in this area to begin with? Um, I was actually writing some books on um, the sexual activities and proclivities of New Zealand politicians and then an intelligence agent um, came and spoke to me and I'd written a, um, a paragraph on Hitler and he said make it a page and then um, two and a half years later it was a 500 page book Really? So it was this, this huge distraction from writing about um, the terrible goings-on of New Zealand politicians. Ah, okay, interesting. So that this was uh, a tip that you got from from uh, from a colleague or or you know a friend? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had um, I had a lot of surveillance activity on my on me at the time. I had um, uh, security intelligence service vehicles in the driveway next door, and I had a police helicopter flying over the house. So an intelligence agent noted this, and he brought two copies of the, and a newspaper and um, became my chauffeur and um, briefed me as he drove me around Auckland City. And that went on for um, two and a half years. Really? Huh. And uh, So I sat in the back taking notes. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so why were you having this surveillance on you? Was this because of the, I, the I, other research I, you were doing? Yeah, yeah, I'd given a speech in the Cook Islands and exposed the Prime Minister, Helen Clark, as a KGB agent. Mm -hmm. And um, ever since then, I've been hounded by the uh, police and judiciary and virtually blacklisted in my architecture practice. Really? And since then, it's become very obvious that um, Prime Minister Helen Clark is a KGB agent, and she was trained in Tavistock, St. Petersburg, and is a graduate of the Freud Hilton. And her training is very similar to Hitler's training where foreign countries um, uh, locate disgruntled individuals and take them back to their country and train them as double agents and then advance them to destroy that foreign country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was what Britain did with Hitler and destroyed Germany totally, and that's what um, Russia is doing with um, Helen Clark. She's absolutely destroying New Zealand and all known vestiges and qualities of uh, the society here. It's almost... Almost a repeat pattern 60 years later. Hmm. History repeats every 60 years, plus or minus two years, the same thing that Hitler did to Germany, Helen Clark's doing to New Zealand. Uh, I, I guess that this also suggests that they have kind of found a, a formula that works, I guess. Yeah, it's basically the Tavistock training, and when that um, officially started up in about... Oh, well, it was actually going on for 500 years, and then it became Tavistock... Um, and the, the the psychological training for the previous uh, 500 years was all um, <clears throat> gathered and centred in one place, and that's been used and developed ever since. So most of the politicians we look at on TV are actually double agents, not serving the country and serving some foreign power and, and essentially serving the New World Order and the central banks. Hmm. So the current move is to make politics so corrupt to create a tax revolt, and then the uh, tax won't be paid to the government. It'll be just an increased interest rate paid to the central banks, and that will be part of the one world order. Hmm. So you're saying that the people, uh, that's the point here, that they actually should 
be uh, so to speak they, they should notice that they are corrupt and they should be become tired of of the politicians oh yeah but i think you know the general public is now beginning to realize whether they're saying it or not that um governments are actually just a mafia operation right and if you look back on the last 35 years what your government has done for your country uh, in new zealand's case it's um absolutely nothing hmm. they've just completely eroded everything and um The judiciary in New Zealand is now a complete, utter and total fraud. Mm -hmm. um, the police in New Zealand are um, rapists and pedophiles and murderers. And the rapists, pedophiles and murderers are promoted to the top positions. So we've got um, 100% corruption happening in the New Zealand government, the New Zealand judiciary, and it's covered up by the New Zealand media. And there's no heterosexuals in the New Zealand media. All right. Uh, yeah, let's. So uh, similar, what's what's happening in New Zealand, which I've written about in my most recent book, mm -hmm. New Zealand: A Black Mother's Guide. That um, that has direct parallels to what was happening in Germany with the pink swastika. Hmm. T tell us about that. Well, you know, Hitler was um, well reputed to be um, uh, homosexual and and cover relationships, and um, he was also a um, coprophiliac. Um, and a lot of his staff were homosexuals that they all fronted as um, fierce fascists. Hmm. And we've got a similar situation in New Zealand where um, 75% of the current government is not heterosexual. And uh, uh, the Prime Minister Helen Clark has introduced the Electoral Finance Bill, which is essentially judicial fascism where no one is allowed to speak up against anyone in government on penalty of something like two years jail without trial hmm. and a $10,000 fine. So, um, so, so what, what um, we've got, what, what people overseas in Sweden and everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, they see New Zealand and they see mountains and rivers and sea and surf and bird life and trees. Right, right. When you live here, it's a, um, it's a mafia operation run by double agents Um, hmm. running at, at um, virtually 100% corruption. I mean, you, you mentioned kind of their own, I guess, you know, personal, I, I would say that their sexual activities or whatnot, you know, to that extent. But are you saying also that this is, is some is some is in some way being used uh, against them then, that, that they can uh, utilize to, you know, either for blackmail or for just, you know, to carry out the, the purposes of, of someone else? Is that what you're saying here? Yeah, yeah well... Um Politics now runs on shame, and the most shamed person is advanced to the highest positions. So um, what happens when someone, let's say Jonathan Hunt, the New Zealand's, um, uh, New Zealand's High Commissioner of Britain, he's a well-known pedophile and international organising pederast, and he, he's advanced to that position as a pedophile, and what he does is he surrounds himself with other pedophiles and other sexual deviants, who won't disclose his pedophilia. Hmm. So then um, we've got a situation where um, right through government from the highest ranks to the lowest ranks, right through the judiciary from the highest to the lowest, right through the police from the highest to the lowest, and right through the media from the highest to lowest hmm. are all pedophile minders who have been nurtured into their positions by either shame or covering for someone else's shame. Hmm. And it was the same with Hitler. This is yeah, definitely. This is very very interesting. You know, uh, we've got a similar situation with the Prime Minister of Denmark. Um, is it R Rasmussen? Uh, Rasmussen, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah he's he's constantly being um, delivered to hospital late at night in a dress. He's a cross dresser takes drugs and has sex in parks mm. and gets either knocked out or drugged out and then delivered to hospital and the nurses there say it's a very nice dress. Sheesh, okay. So you've got a Prime Minister mm. in Denmark who's a cross-dresser who's been promoted to that position mm. by a shame. Hmm. Uh, it sounds, again, uh, you know, very much like the, uh, well, a version at least of, of the uh, eyes wide shot kind of type, you know, parties. E exactly. Exactly what it is. Mm. That's um, incredibly accurate. Hmm. 
and um, it did something to Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman's marriage. Yeah, well, that's right, exactly. It busted that wide apart. Yeah, it did. Uh, and hmm. that was just acting the part. Weird, yeah. Being it. Mm, strange. You know the, what? The, that's, the, mm, yeah, please continue. The sort of the sort of sexual deviancy that is happening now amongst politicians, which can be very well documented now, can be directly paralleled back to Hitler's time. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Hitler was um, was an incredible sexual deviant. What, what, uh, where does the information for that co- uh, come from in regards to how his, you know, how his sexual orientation was? Well, he's, he's well recorded as a cop affiliate, which means he, he liked to be. Um, it's called scat, is the colloquial name. He liked to be defecated on. Mm-hmm. And it was um, Eva Braun um, was one of the first people he found who was comfortable doing that, and that brought a huge amount of shame. Um, and so it had to be very in-house. Um, so, uh, you know, that made Hitler absolutely controllable. And originally Hitler was trained by the British between um, uh, February to November 1912 um, in Ireland and England in the Tavistocks. Mm-hmm. And then he lived in Liverpool from November 1912 to May 1913. Now, so he was. Mm-hmm. He spoke very good English. He was. Um, he was well, well and truly trained as a British agent, and he was sent to Germany and promoted through the ranks to um, destroy the German military, which he did completely. And then he had Germany fund Israel out of uh, guilt of so-called killing six million Jews. Mm-hmm. And, um, Germany now funds Israel. Right, exactly. And will do so until, I think it's 2094 is when the payments are due to stop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, th- that's uh, what you're saying, that there, that uh, Adolf Hitler was in England uh, between or in and around 1912 to 1913. As I understand, this is something that uh, was supported by his, uh, was it sister-in-law's book, The Memoirs of, of Bridget Hitler? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And she talked about this in in her uh, in her book. She talked about it in incredible depth, and from a position of um, domesticity, like from a position of being in the home and and having him around and living with him, etc. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hitler was constantly poring over maps and talking about Germany's takeover of Britain and Europe, etc. Mm. He had been deconstructed, which means that his mind was now aligned to the mind of the British government and the British war plans as opposed to having his own subconscious mind. The subconscious mind had been trained and taken over by the British government. Huh. But you th- uh, do you think he was kind of totally mind control or was there still some kind of force, uh, you know, his personal side that was driving you know, him somewhere? Um, well, you still you, in G- deconstruction. You still have a conscious mind and an unconscious mind, mm-hmm. but your subconscious mind is, is um, completely controlled. And the subconscious mind controls the will, and it controls the future of the person and the um, meetings, opportunity, and synchronicity of the person. Mm-hmm. So that aspect of Hitler was completely taken over. Uh, plus, because he was trained by a British agent, he was then supported by other. Um, double agents in Germany, mm. and including the um, central bank finances, financiers well, who were um, looking to create a war between Britain, Germany, and other countries, mm. um, so that they could fund both sides of the war and that way bankrupt the countries, take control of the governments, and make huge profits. Right. And that's exactly what happened. Everything went according to plan, mm. except for Hitler's escape, which was a day late. Okay, okay, tell us about that. <laughs> okay. Um, it's called Operation Winnie the Pooh, and it was tacked on to Operation James Bond. Now, Operation James Bond was a move by um, Ian Fleming, and the two I see of that was Chris Crichton, to remove Martin Bormann out of Berlin on the 2nd of May, 1945. Mm. And that eventuated, and um, M... Um, Desmond Morton eventually took Martin Bormann back to Berlin for his own war trial, which 
be viewed from the um, uh, what do you call it from the viewing docks in the court mm -hmm. um, with plastic surgery, so it wouldn't be recognised. So Martin Borman was actually at his own trial, but not um, not acknowledged as being physically present. Hmm. And tacked on to um, Operation James Bond was Operation Winnie the Pooh, which was the operation to remove Adolf Hitler out of Berlin. Um, and um, once Ian Fleming, who was head of Operation James Bond, had cited Martin Borman and cited him as the real Martin Borman, he then split off into Operation Winnie the Pooh and went from um, uh, Berlin City banks of the River Spree in a launch up to um, Lake Mugglesey. Mm -hmm. And um, then he met Hitler, who flew in in a um, Junkers Ju-52 uh, 3M G14E, which is essentially a hot rod plane. Uh, it was covered in corrugated iron, but it had all the latest gear on it. And um, uh, Hannah Reich landed Hitler and Eva Braun in Lake Mugglesey, and they were met by um, uh, Commander Ian Fleming and um, Carolyn Saunders, who were both dressed in um, Russian military uniforms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the um, parcels were passed with the um, uh, full and partial bank numbers of Swiss bank accounts. Um, and then Hitler and Eva Braun got on board and they were acknowledged as Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit only. And then they were, uh, the, the launch was uh, beached and they, then they got onto a um, Western Lysander 3A, which was flown by Hugh Verity, and they flew off to um, Barcelona, hmm. met by Ramon Serrano Suna, who was the two IC, former 2IC of General Franco. And then Hitler lived out his days in... Um, um, Barcelona in the Parc de Citadella and in the uh, Montserrat Monastery. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a story. <laughs> so he did. He did get away. That's what you're saying here. And this was. Yeah, and it, basically everyone, everyone who was there, and all the um, important people and intelligent people acknowledged that um, Hitler did not die in the bunker. Mm -hmm. uh, they found um, six body doubles on top of the bunker and they found another body double um, that was in the bunker that had been, it was outside and burnt. Mm. That was definitely a body double and um, Eisenhower said that um, that they hadn't found Hitler. Stalin said that they hadn't found Hitler and um, Colonel W.F. Heimlich of the American Military Intelligence said it's unlikely that Hitler died in the bunker. Mm. And all the news reports said um, Hitler didn't die in the bunker. And then a poll um, in America um, soon after the war, um, it was poll, uh, Gallup poll number I-527, and it was something like 80% of Americans said that they hadn't captured Hitler and Hitler did not die in the bunker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, was general, it was generally thought then that Hitler did not die in the bunker. And they didn't actually request for a death certificate of Hitler until 1952. Really? And um, in the uh, Potsdam um, meeting, and um, it was that, um, I can't remember when that one was, um, the Potsdam meeting, um, they took Hitler off the list of war criminals. So Hitler was actually never declared as a war criminal. Hmm. I think that's partly because he was a, um, a Rothschild. He was the um, uh, grandson of Lionel Nathan Rothschild, who was the first Jewish-British MP and um, mm -hmm. uh, ran the um, central bank. That's another kind of very interesting tra uh, trail, so to speak, in this story. Uh, and and let's, yeah, let's dive into that right away. I mean... Uh, I, I guess that the the story goes, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, what was it, Maria Schrickel Gruber, Hitler's grandmother, uh, w was a maid in the Rothschilds uh, Vienna mansion. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. And they um, um, got her pregnant in a um, a cult um, um, act scene play kind of thing um, on the. I think it was the 31st of August um, on that year and then um, as 
soon as, as soon as she showed that she was pregnant, she was sent back to um, Strones to live. This is so. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, she was. Um, she gave birth to Alloy Hitler, um, who was then a um, customs officer, and Alloy Hitler was actually first cousin with Winston Churchill. Really. Huh. Is there a genealogy yeah, made on this, or how how what's do it, we what's know? That? Uh, is there genealogy genealogy that has been uh, you know uh, taken down on this, so so we know that? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got it all. Um, what I did is I I wrote Hitler was a British agent. And that's 550 pages. So uh, the book weighs a kilogram, and then um, it raised a few questions. So I had a few critics saying, well, what about this? What about this? You've made a few statements and you haven't qualified them, and that was basically because I. I didn't have room, and the, the book would have ended up being 2,000 pages long. Mm-hmm. So I wrote three backup books to Hitler Was a British Agent. They are How to Take Over the World, A Right Royal Con, Stalin's British Training, uh, Breeding Concubines, Pedophiles at War, and Gifting the United Nations to Stalin. Mm-hmm. And those books talk in depth about the um, genealogy and the various illegitimate children um, Amongst the Rothschilds, the British royal family, um, and the German command and the Russian command. You know, I, I've seen pictures actually comparing uh, Stalin and and uh, I can't remember which one of of, of the Rothschilds it was, uh, but they actually look very very similar. Uh, and and with the what what your input, what you're saying here now with the Churchill and so forth, uh, seems to suggest then that um, many of the Shall we call them puppets then of of this, you know, of the of the world elite? They they who are uh, in front of the camera, so to speak, that are there to grab the attention. That they potentially then are the uh, illegitimate offspring of of the well. Uh, do you think they all belong to the Roch- Rothschild uh, dynasty? Oh yeah, yeah. The 20th century was a family operation, and it was a Rothschild's family operation. And the front people were generally illegitimate Rothschilds. So Winston Churchill was an illegitimate Rothschild. Mm-hmm. Um, Joseph Stalin was an illegitimate Rothschild, and Adolf Hitler was the son of an illegitimate Rothschild. Hmm. So the whole British royal family are illegitimate Rothschilds. So Winston Churchill could do whatever he wanted. He could run for five parties and become prime minister three times mm. because he was related to the British royal family and he was related to the Rothschilds. He was actually invited to become prime minister by King George the Sixth, who was um, his nephew. Hmm. So we're kind of cornered in here. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, if, as soon as you see the 20th century as being a family operation, and it was, it's well regarded as a warring century. Hmm. And if you look at the um, wars as being incredibly profitable to the banks and not at all profitable to the countries. Rather, they bankrupt the countries. Mm-hmm. Um, then you can see that um, that the illegitimate Rothschilds are the perfect agents to lead countries into war. And as soon as you've got a country that's being led into war, you should look at what their genealogy is and how they're linked to the Rothschilds. Uh, George Bush, Tony Blair? Well, supposedly Tony Blair is related to the British royal family. Mm. Um, in my view, he looks incredibly like Prince Andrew, and others view <laughs> incredibly like Prince Charles. Yeah, yeah. And um, in my view, the um, lips and jawline and um, laughter and demeanour of Tony Blair and Prince Andrew are so similar that they can't be photographed together. <laughs> I don't think they've ever met together publicly and been photographed together, and that's a telltale sign. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you mentioned oh. Prince. Uh, sorry to interrupt there, but I just want to kind of interject this that you mentioned Prince Andrew, uh, and, and recently there was uh, a piece of news that actually came out, just kind of hinting a little bit, at least, of of what you're suggesting in regards to. Uh, you know the the sexual you know uh, party so to speak that that potentially is ongoing uh, where someone called let's see here Gislaine Maxwell I guess this was a story in Mail on Sunday uh, from Mail on Sunday uh, that came out that talked about uh, uh, um, let's see here 
a uh, looking at the notes here, uh, she was a basically a uh, an an aide in the ha household of uh, uh, the Epsteins, I, I think. And she was invited to a lot of parties where, among others, she encountered Prince Andrew. And, and she uh, basically retelled the story that this was a lot of weird, you know, stuff going on. And she was actually, you know, fondled, so to speak, and stuff like this. So once in a while, it seems to be that this the, these kind of stories are leaking out in the mainstream media. Have, have you yourself heard about this? Uh, no, I haven't heard, heard about, um, haven't heard about that, no. Um, but if we look at, um, Churchill, going back to the bigger Second World War picture, mm -hmm. Churchill was the son of King Edward VII and Jenny Jerome Churchill. So, um, Winston Churchill was British royalty. Now, King Edward VII was the illegitimate child of Queen Victoria and Nathan Mayer Rothschild. Mm -hmm. And Queen Victoria was also the son, uh, also the daughter of Nathan Mayer Rothschild. So mm -hmm. Winston Churchill's grandfather and great-grandfather were the same person. Mm -hmm. And Nathan Mayer Rothschild had faked his own death in 1836 and actually lived until 1850. Mm -hmm. So Nathan Mayer Rothschild produced children with Queen Victoria, who was his daughter, until he produced a male heir, so he produced Princess of Victoria with a K, and then King Edward VII. And the shame of that was enough to completely control the British royal family. Hmm. And um, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Consort Albert, was illegitimate. He was the son of a stable boy called Alexander Hanstein. Mm -hmm. And Alexander Hanstein eventually became the Count of Polzig. Hmm. And um, had no more children, died in obscurity, and never reached the media. Uh, so the whole hmm. British royal family is illegitimate. They're a complete subset of the Rothschild family. And they are controlled through shame. Hmm. But they are related to, I mean, a lot of the, the, the older, so to speak, um, like the Habsburgs and and the Stuarts and and the Hanovers, you know. Say, say that again. I couldn't quite hear. Uh, but but they are, I mean, related to the Habsburgs, the the Hanovers, the Stuarts, and so forth. So I guess that they're still kind of in in the in the bloodline mix, so to speak, wouldn't you say? Yeah, um, yeah but when you You've got the standard family tree, which, you know, they sort of display, and then you've got the illegitimate family tree, which is the true control of the government. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true control of the monarchy, and then the monarchy controls the government, like um, Prince Philip controls MI6. Mm -hmm. Prince Charles has a go at um, controlling MI5, as does Queen Elizabeth. So, you know, to say that the monarchy has nothing to do with politics is just a shonky load of shit. Sure. <laughs> Um, you know, let's go back a little bit and, and uh, focus on on, uh, on Hitler again. And one of the things um, that I think that you wrote about, and this was in regards to uh, when Hitler, after he was in in, uh, in England or Britain, uh, he returned to to Germany uh, in uh, I guess May 1913. He enlisted in the German army. Uh, during World War One, he served as a, as a as a runner and actually was captured, I think, twice by the English. Uh, but on both occasions, he was um, he was spared, uh, you know, a trial or, or execution or whatever it might be. Uh, have you written about this in in your book? Yeah, yeah, I have. He was um, he was spared by a British intelligence officer, and the British intelligence officer in the beginning of World War Two was working as a police constable in Liverpool and he was walking around the streets going to think I could have um, stopped all of this crap mm -hmm. and then he was approached by um, MI5, MI6 and told to quote shut the fuck up <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Hitler was protected because he was, the, uh, he was a Rothschild and because he was trained as a British agent. So 
um, whenever he was captured in World War One, he mm. was actually a British asset, so he would be saved and sent back to his side. So he had complete immunity to be a runner and not be um, uh, not be shot or charged, or convicted, or, or become a prisoner of war. Mm. Mm. And then there was a uh, a Jew who promoted him by um, awarding him medals, which he absolutely did not deserve. Hmm. Interesting. You know, in regards to either if we talk about Hitler or other potentially double agents of of the elite, um, I mean, there are things, um, you know, there are kind of, uh, well, if we, if we focus on Hitler, that, that actually are very strange in, in regards to how he was um, managing things, so to speak, towards the end. Uh, and what that could suggest to me then is that actually either his kind of um, you know his his mind control. Um, you know his handlers, whatever, were kind of losing control of him, and, and he was kind of breaking up or something internally. Or do you think that this was by design? What I'm talking about here, of course, is things that he actually, you know, went into Russia uh, during you know the winter yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you about that. Like, yeah, like um, uh, like in the Battle of Britain, Hitler had every chance to take over England. They had superior air forces. Mm. And there's there's no way that Britain could defend. So uh, Germany self-sabotaged by not having enough petrol on their planes to make the return flight home. So they were mm. um, ditching their own planes in the um, English Channel. <laughs> um, and then um, Hitler was made to come up with the very very dumb idea of Operation Barbarossa, which was to attack on two fronts and and no longer attack Britain and take it over, but to right. attack um, Russia. Right. And that just extended the war. It killed a whole lot of people and. Wars are essentially a cold hit, so by attacking on two fronts it becomes a desperate war and fighting Russia in winter is just um, the dumbest idea ever. Well, I mean, uh, uh, so Napoleon did it and he did the same thing that Hitler did, basically. Yeah. He left his troops <laughs> out there. Frozen men to death. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Huh. Um, yeah. I mean, this seems to be like a like a, a standard, you know, set that they're using, you know, to get. Uh, well, there are, again, there are people saying that uh, wars also is is an idea of you know keeping culling the population, so to speak, and, and actually getting rid well, of it, a lot it of. It is, and there are rules on the war that are secret. And one of the rules in the Vietnam War was that America was not allowed to win the war, mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. they were they had to get authority before they attacked, and most often they were not given authority. Hmm. Um, and um, as with regards to Hitler's um, decisions in the last nine months of World War II, they were completely erratic, and his own commanding officers did not understand any logic in what he was trying to do, and there was no logic in what he was trying to do, and the last nine months of World War II was an absolute killing spree, and that was when most of the people died, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that was when the um, German military got utterly annihilated, and Hitler actually went round and, and murdered his own um, more patriotic officers hmm. um, and commanders. Um, so Hitler was, in the last nine months of the war, Hitler was very definitely acting for the British, and in return for that, the British got Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun out of Berlin in Operation Winning the Pooh. Mm. Um, and they got out of Berlin um, at 5 p.m. on the 2nd of May, 1945, leaving from Lake Mugglesea in a Western Lysander 3A flown by Hugh Verity. Um, do, do you think that, um, you know, the, the what do they call it, the July 20th plot or Operation Walkery was a way to actually. So I'm sorry. Could you, could you say that again? I couldn't quite hear. Okay. Uh, the the July 20th plot, or the what is known as the Operation Walkery. Uh, do you think yeah. that this was an attempt uh, by, by those on the inside uh, that um, you know they were trying to save what Hitler actually had built up before it was too late? What do you think that was? Um. A lot of um, Hitler's commanders and um, intelligence officers, etc., realised that Hitler was actually a double agent. And I think it was Stauffenberg. Um, he, he tried to kill Hitler. And um, Hitler got word of it and moved from the concrete bunker, which would have enclosed the explosion and killed him, mm-hmm. to an open bunker and then replaced himself with a doppelganger. And the bomb went off 
his doppelganger was killed, and then the doppelganger was dragged into the back room, and then Hitler was put in the clothes of the um, of the of the dead doppelganger, and walked out virtually without a scratch. Hmm. As having miraculously survived, and Hitler had about eighteen or so doppelgangers, and he chewed through at least eight of them. Really? Sheesh. Yeah. Hmm. So if it wasn't for his doppelgangers, he would have been dead eight times. Hmm. Um, let's see here. You know, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the the money trail also, because this is a, an, another kind of. Uh, side to all of this that that also ties in with what we've been talking about so far uh, in, in regards to the financing itself and the, the build up of, of Germany uh, before the war is this something that you you uh, go into in in your book yeah I talk about um, Hitler buying the um, beer back the newspaper and he went to his commander and his commander said that he would ring his cousins in England and his cousins in England um, financed the newspaper for Hitler, which allowed him to have his own uninterfered with propaganda machine. Hmm. So Hitler was event, uh, essentially funded by the Bank of England, and the Bank of England by then was completely, utterly and totally owned and controlled by the central bank, which was um, run by the Rothschilds, and the Rothschilds were um, um, Hitler's um, grandfather's sons, hmm. uh, his cousins. Mm. His uncles, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there was, was just an absolutely massive con. If you can imagine a poker game and then put it on a worldwide scale and then span it out over 150 years, that was it. Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, it's again, it's it's too. Uh, it's a very very difficult thing to kind of to comprehend on on that level. And I mean, again, we have to. I think what we have to look at or, or you know to try to get to the whole picture and try to understand why this is being done uh, this is a plan I guess as you said you know several times now to uh, centralize everything to um, you know basically eradicate all the the small factions that were le left in the world at that time at least to get rid of those uh, either countries or, or people or royalty or whatever uh, to get it under this one uh, centralized ruling, um, you know, elite, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's a, um, a, a one world order. A one world order run by the central banks, which is run by the Rothschilds, who are essentially the parent family to the British royal family. Mm. And the British royal family is the um, most obvious royal family in the world. And most of the other ones were eradicated in the um, uh, from 1914 to the 1920s. Mm. They were just completely disbanded or murdered. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it, seem, it seems like we're kind of are in the the end end throes of of the big the big plan. I mean, think that there aren't that many things left for for them to conquer. Basically, if if uh, if we look at it, I mean, things happen okay uh, occasionally. Uh, like the invasion of Iraq, I don't know if that suggests, you know, that there are kind of rogue elements still, of, or if that is, you know, some people even suggest that Saddam again was in on it, so to speak, that, and they were just, you know, in the interest at this time to get rid of him because they wanted to control the area themselves or whatnot. I don't know. Any ideas about that? Uh, yeah, well, um, scientists have, have uh, long discovered that um, oil is not a fossil fuel, that is a product of the sun's of the Earth's reaction with the sun and the um, central core, the um, inner core and the outer core, and then oil is virtually spun out by centrifugal force up through the mantle and to the surface, and that um, oil fields like in Nigeria that were um, deemed to be dry mm. uh, have now refilled, and oil is a replenishable source, and the um, half-life of the world's oil population, etc., of the oil um, quantities, is just a crock of shit, <laughs> and uh, um, that oil is a, um, uh, a finite resource, is a crock of shit. Hmm. Uh, it is a renewable resource, and oil is being used as an excuse for war, and then war profits the central banks, and for instance has bankrupted America in the case of the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Actually, every big war that America's got involved in has bankrupted America. So America is, um, is a completely and multiply bankrupt country, 
uh, its constitution isn't worth the paper it's printed on. And the Queen of England writes the laws for America, and Americans pay their tax to the Queen of England. And mm. the Queen of England is another illegitimate Rothschild in a long line of Rothschilds mm. uh, that have parented the British royal family and virtually created the British royal family. Mm. Mm. Um, so Iraq has been taken over because it's an oil resource, and if America doesn't have oil, then it is um, in the Stone Age. And then in turn, America is controlled by Israel, and Israel is just a representative of the central bank's social policy. So when America attacks Iraq, it's actually securing oil for the central bank, which then gives the central bank more control over all the other countries in the world. Right, right. So um, all the wars that have happened um, have either happened in um, drug countries, because governments love to feed drugs to their own population and then uh, put them on social welfare, which is communism, or um, kill them and break up families and destroy marriages, and etc. Um, uh, so wars are either in drug countries or oil countries. Right, uh, Afghanistan, of course. The the poppies began again after you know when the Taliban was taken taken down the what, what the second time or whatnot. I don't know how how long they've been going on there, but for that short period of time, uh, you know, when the Taliban was was uh, ruling the country, so to speak, they they got rid of a lot of the the poppy fields. But uh, you know, very soon after that, the U.S. invaded again, and now it's you know back up to producing standards, I guess, again, you know. Yeah, yeah, and 98% of the um, heroin that gets into England comes from Afghanistan. Right. And it's flown there by NATO. NATO is now um, taking over the CIA as the biggest uh, drug trafficker in the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when um, uh, Schaefer, um joins another country like Australia and New Zealand in 2005 uh, into the NATO fold, officially joins them, he seals the deal with, um, in New Zealand's case, 10 kilograms of Afghan heroin. Hmm. Sheesh. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I so want to... All the authority figures, all the authority figures that we're looking at going, oh, you know, these are great figures that offer stability in the world. They're actually mafia operations doing whatever they can to destroy society, destroy families, um, and create wars. So there's, there's no good going on in government or central government no benefit to any personal society but well, what, what is it why do you think that that these has has gotten hold such a strong hold of of well basically earth at this point i mean many people are again that's the, the main uh, question so to speak of course that many people are pondering upon what's the what's the main idea what's what's what what is it all about i mean either it's about uh, Uh, getting rid of a lot of people, or it's just about sustaining again uh, them as a criminal family, getting more money, getting more wealth, and just controlling everything. Uh, uh, what are your ideas about that? What, what's the main objective, main motive? Uh, the main ob- motive is to create a dead zone. Like uh, according to the Georgia Guidestones, they want to reduce the world's population down to 500,000 people. Uh, 500,000? 500. 500, Five hundred million, I think it is. Five hundred million, yeah. So, mm. so they, and it's six point five billion at the moment. So they want to uh, uh, cull twelve out of thirteen people. So you've got like um, chemtrails, and they're spraying aluminium and barium, and sort of bovine cancer and and sheep sickness in mm. the air. And mm. the aluminium floats down. And, uh, we breathe it in. It lodges in the brain, and then that becomes a receptor for mm. just sent by harp a high active rural research project. <clears throat> project. Um, so that, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is to, uh, for those survivors is to create a dead zone where people are just um, working and paying the tax and then going home and watching TV and looking at further programming. So they're looking at, at absolutely 100% control of the human population and 100% control of the planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, so far they own about uh, over 90% of the planet. So now what they're doing is they're... Um, They've already made all the social policy around the world socialistic, which is a front for communism. So in a lot of countries, most of the um, uh, tenets of communism are uh, in place. And now they're trying to take over the food sources by um, removing any quality elements out of the food, um, poisoning the protein elements like um, uh, sheep and, and cows, and um, 
removing the um, natural fish source by overfishing and then um, uh, taking over the energy resources which is to create wars around wherever there is oil and then use that as justification for doubling, tripling and quadrupling the price of oil. Hmm. So they can only justify an increase in the price of oil if they have a war around oil fields. Right. And in the case of Saddam Hussein, he was an American agent, he was a double agent, and he was run by George Herbert Bush from the 1950s. Hmm. Um, and, um, Saddam Hussein's death on the 30th of December, was it 2006? Mm, I think um, it was, yeah. That, that was completely faked. Well, that, uh, exactly, because of the, I, I saw this in the movie, the, the, the Ring of Power, I think, and this was about the uh, the dates, actually, in the ba uh, in the background, that they were uh, ripe or yellow at the, at the time, and this suggests that at least uh, this was staged, uh, I think, three months earlier or something like that. Is that what you're thinking about? Uh, well, it was definitely staged, and i tell you how it was staged and how badly it was staged. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to hear about that? Sure, sure. Okay, um, um, first of all, it wasn't Saddam, it was his doppelganger. Mm -hmm. um, they they did the whole thing in a really small room, and they had um, the stairs going up to the upper platform for the hanging. Those stairs were industrial stairs with a standard um, lip on the tread. So if you measure the lip on the tread and the height of the stairs, that lip is about um, 25 or 30 millimetres. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the rise on the treads um, was about 100 and 106 millimetres, whereas normally it's 176 millimetres. So the height distance from the um, ground floor to the hanging floor was 2 metres, whereas normally it would be 2.7 metres. Mm -hmm. And the rope that he was hung with was looped on the handrail, and the handrail would normally be 1 metres high one metre high, but that handrail was only 0 0.7 metres high. And by the time they took the rope from the hanging position, uh, the, the bit that was locked into the ceiling, to uh, two or three paces forward to where it was on the handrail and then looped around the handrail, the rope was actually um, 3.8 metres long. So when they uh, looped it around Saddam's neck, he landed, was body double, he landed on the floor below with his feet on a mattress mm -hmm. and was not hung. There's no way he could be hung. Um, and the rope was pulled taut by other agents below. And then they had shots of Saddam with his head tilted back, swinging around with mm. the lights supposedly flashing on and off because it was supposedly filmed by a mobile phone. Yeah, yeah. But when you're hung, your, your neck actually uh, falls to one side and it actually looks snapped and broken. And Saddam's neck did not look snapped or broken. It was just tilted back in a position that you could do yourself. Hmm. Uh, so there's no way that, that he was um, killed. And then supposedly his um, body was taken away later that evening um, in a coffin. And um, uh, but there's no check on the body being in that coffin. Hmm. And the whole thing was just a complete, utter crock of shit. And that was filmed by a mobile cameras as a joke. It was heavily edited so that only the most keen eye could see that it was a total fraud. Hmm. Right, and I, I remember... They even, had, hmm? they even had a short person in front of the camera in the early shots so that the stairs would look full height. Really? Hmm. Every, yeah, all the people were chosen for their size, and it was completely... Um, it was a completely staged, magical event. Hmm. I know that this actually was done also on, uh, uh, I don't know if I pronounced this correctly, but Eid, uh, Eid al-Adha, this is the, basically the festival of sacrifice, the, kind of a semi-holy day, I guess, within the, the Muslim religion. So that's pretty interesting. Oh, that's when it was done? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then what I was thinking about earlier was the fact that, um, uh, you know, when they captured him uh, in the background when this was done, and I think that they they captured him in, uh, let's see if I remember correctly, I think it was in December. Uh, yeah, yeah, 13 to 
December 2003, wasn't it? Uh, no, no, 2006. In December 2006, they captured him. And in, oh, the, sorry, yep. in, and in the background, uh, they had uh, ripe dates that actually was yellow. And, and this suggests yeah. that, uh, you know, to Iraqis, they knew that this is only only takes place actually in and around July. So this, yeah. uh, you know, this suggests that either they were somewhere else or, you know, this thing was uh, done three months earlier. But for some reason, they choose to, chose to show the pictures of that at that time, you know. Yeah, it's almost like they want to know, well, they want the public to know that what they are doing is a hoax. Right. And that you should realize that all of history has been a hoax. And that you've never lived in history, you've only ever lived in the con. You know, before we, we round things up here, Greg, uh, I want to leave the, the last few minutes to you so you can mention uh, all, all of the books that you got here. And, and our interview today was kind of a, I guess, a mix between between them all, so to speak. And, that, and that's okay, yeah. that's, that's fine. But uh, mention the books that you have there and how people that are interested in getting a copy uh, can, can get it. Yep, yeah, okay. Um, uh, the web address is www.greghallett.com That's G-R-E-G-H-A-L-L-E-T-T dot com uh, The books are Are You My Father? The Family Court and Other Experiments Hitler Was a British Agent How to Take Over the World to Right Royal Con Darlin's British Training Breeding Concubines Pedophiles at War Gifting the United Nations to Stalin and New Zealand, A Blackmailer's Guide. That's uh, six books. Excellent. Uh, again, the address is greghallett.com. And uh, I want to thank you very much for you know coming on the program here today and, and, and sharing your your ideas, your research and your theories with us because it's been very interesting in, in uh, hearing it. So thank you. Thank you, Heinrich.